Thank you. Man, it's so good to be here with you guys. Um, my wife uh, is pregnant with our seventh child. Yeah. And he was actually due today. So last week I asked the doctor, I go, can we have him early? Like, can you induce so I can be a passion? And they said, yeah. So I had a, I had a baby boy last week. And uh, yeah. But that will be his legacy. He was born December 26th, so his dad could be a passion. Um, <laughs> hey, will you guys pray with me? I, but, but, but I mean, like, really pray with me to where let's, let's fight to block everything out of our minds, like everything except for him, and really come into his presence right now. Let's pray. God, it's an honor to be in your presence. Like Louis talked about last night, it's only because everything was done for us that we dare come into your presence. It's only because of the cross, because it was finished on the cross. And so, Father, thank you for letting us come into your presence, gifting us with this. And God, right now, I pray for every person in this room. God, our minds are so cluttered with so many things. And we're so used to jumping from one thought to another and one thing to another real quickly. And God, help us to focus right now. I pray that you would open our eyes so we could see your holiness, your beauty. God, so that we would just joyfully surrender everything to you. God, we read in your word about times when you initiate something. It's so powerful that's of you, and it's nothing that we manipulate or create, God. It's you. And we're just saying, God, that's what we want to experience. God, I pray this never gets common to us. Just come into your presence again. Help us, Lord. Restore the awe in our relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, uh, for some of you, a lot of you that have been to passion before, it's, it's like everything else in life, things can lose their awe. And I don't want us to lose that. Even, even when we were just giving. Um, man, some of you are parts of a, you're part of a great church where you, you care for the poor. You, you, you know, you care for those who have never heard the gospel and you give towards things like that. You give your offering. It's not taken from you, but you offer it. And that's a great thing. And, and I've been doing that for years, but I even noticed myself, sometimes it can become a routine and I don't want us to ever lose the awe of how amazing this is that we get to help another human being. Man, I saw a picture just, just two weeks ago that brought me to tears, okay? Because last year, last year after I left Passion in January, um, I went to Africa. And I want to show you, yeah, some of you from Africa, right on. Um, but I want to show you a picture. This isn't the one that brought me to tears, but it, it's definitely emotional. Uh, if you could show that first picture of these kids that I, I met last year. It, 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 was, it was breathtaking for me to, to see some of the poverty. But I got another picture just two weeks ago. Okay, so this was January. Then two weeks ago, I got this picture, the next picture. The same kid. Go ahead and show the next one so you can see the comparison. And go ahead and go to the next picture. So that's her. 
I mean, it brought me to tears because I remember seeing that, that one kid in particular because they, you know, some, someone took a picture of it and then, then, and, and then when I saw that other, I'm going, there's no way, that's the same girl. Because I remember specifically getting on my knees with her and praying for her because I'm going, God, they're telling me she's not going to make it, but God, you can do anything. So, so God, would you please just get her to live long enough to hear your gospel and understand you? And so when I saw that picture, I'm going, no way, she made it. I, I, that, that picture, it brought me to tears because I, 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 this isn't about a cause. Okay, it's about a person, like her soul is every bit as important as mine. I just happened to be born here. I just was put in a different situation. But the thrill of thinking, man, I had a piece in that? I, I, I got to participate in that? I, I got to see the way she was and how she is now. And that, that's why, you know, a lot of times we can give and we forget just the amazing thing that it's, that's happening there. Man, I, I, the, the picture also just reminded me of the time I had there. We had this worship service. And it was all, it was all women except for me and a couple other guys. But uh, I have a girl's name, so it's okay. And uh, I, I went... And it was all girls that had been rescued out of sex slavery. I mean, I had just gone to the red light district where they used to work, um, or not work, but were kind of forced into this where they would sleep with guys for a dollar, you know, and they would have to sleep with five, five, six guys every night. And I'm just watching these guys go from one little room to the next little room. And it's just, it was disgusting. And I, one of these girls who shared their testimonies her, her, first, her first sentence was, I was a toilet. That's the way she saw herself. Like, I'm just a, a place where guys come and they relieve themselves and they move on. And but then to be in a room where these gals had found the Lord, turned their lives around, and, and to see them now leading worship. Man, I, I mean, it wasn't, I mean, this was good, but I'm telling you, it was incredible to see these people rising up, and, and it just got me excited, because even that picture of that gal, I'm thinking, man, there's so many like her, like this army that's rising up out there, that's saying, you know what, I know what life used to be like before Jesus came and rescued me, and I just, I, I get excited about what is happening in these other places, and so for you, when you give, understand this isn't just giving to some unknown cause. It's about people that are rising up that I believe God is going to do amazing things through. Because when we give them the chance to hear the gospel, to respond to the gospel, to live a semi-normal life, and then to use their minds and their giftings to make a difference in their countries, I, I just don't know anything better to, to give to. Um, but don't lose the awe in that. And, and don't, don't, don't lose the awe in what we do when we worship here. Okay? Like, it's amazing. I love coming to Passion every year. But my prayer is that it's equally as amazing to you when you're alone with God with this book. And that it's equally or even more amazing to you when you're with five friends in a room who can't play guitar very well and don't sing well, and yet you're all just in awe because you're, what makes worship awesome is the object of our worship. Okay? It's, it's, it's when you're alone in a room and you're going, wow, it is just me and him. This is incredible. Or you've got five, six people in a room holding hands going, man, we're about to talk to him. This is awesome. Man, this is great. I love worshiping with thousands of people, but I will tell you, man, I love just as much, maybe even more, just to be alone in the presence of him. And I hope you feel the same way about him. You know, I was reading... Uh, Exodus chapter 19 a couple weeks ago, and I just started repenting. Um, it had such an impact on me. I want to I read some of it uh, to you. 
In Exodus 19, starting in verse 9, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm coming to you in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. When Moses told the words of the people to the Lord, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their garments and be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set limits for the people all around saying, take care not to go up into the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall be stoned or shot, whether beast or man, he shall not live. When the trumpet sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. Okay, this is God speaking to Moses. And, and the first thing, he's telling Moses, Moses, I'm going to appear, I'm going to appear in a thick cloud. Okay, I want you to let all the people know. He goes, and the reason why I'm doing this is because I want them to believe in you forever. Okay, because right now you're saying, oh yeah, I meet with God, I meet with God. I want, I want them to see, no, you meet with me. And he says, so I want you to get them ready. Prepare them, consecrate them. They're going to see a human being interact with God. This is an incredible moment. But as I was reading this passage, you know, and it talks about, okay, set limits, set boundaries. Make sure the people don't walk up into the mountain. Make sure they don't even touch the base of the mountain. If they even touch the base of the mountain, I want you to kill them. In fact, but, but don't even touch him. I don't even want you touching that unholy person. Just grab a stone or shoot him. Don't even touch that person. And I remember when I read that, I thought, gosh, that seems harsh. That's the first thought, I, I'm just being honest with you. That feels extreme. So if some guy, even accidentally, touches the base of the mountain, you've got to stone him to death? And as I was pondering that, I, I just... I realize why, why is that so hard for me to stomach? And I realize it's a lot of it is because I've grown up in a generation that questions God for setting boundaries and questions his right to be able to set boundaries. I've also grown up in a generation where to meet with God is a very ordinary or common thing. And what God is showing here is this is not just an ordinary thing. This is holy. Holy is the opposite of common. This is set apart. It's distinct. And he wanted everyone to know, look, a man is about to meet with God. So you don't even want to get too close to this. Don't, I'm setting parameters here. And then he goes on in, in verse 16. This is on the morning of the third day. There were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. So that all the people in the, so, so that all the, people in, the tam, in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. Man, I... The reason why this, this kind of just brought me to repentance was I realized how scattered my mind was and how sometimes I need so many different things to be just right so that I can worship and focus and sometimes how I can be critical during a worship service um, of a musician or a singer 
or a style of music. There's so many things that distract me. And I'm reading this going, man, this was a holy moment when a human being came before God. It was an event where people came out and they go, you don't want to miss this. In fact, if you read in Exodus 33, it talks about how, how when, when Moses used to go out to the tent, he, 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 he laid, man, let's just turn there so I don't mess it up. Exodus, uh, Exodus 33, verse 7 says, Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever, whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up, and each would stand at his door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship, each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. I'm sure the tent looked different than this, but... I, 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 I want you to just kind of grasp this. Okay, this is the way it used to be. You know, first you had that scene in, in Exodus 19 where all the people were going, okay, we're about to see Moses go up the mountain and we're going to see God come from heaven and the two are going to connect and he's going to talk. And, and God says, I want, I want them to see this. I want them to hear my voice. And it says every time Moses spoke, God responded and the people would just hear this thunder. I mean, can you imagine that? And, I just, and, and then later on, it became this practice where, where Moses would have this tent called the tent of meeting. And, and, and everyone knew, hey, Moses is going to go meet with God right now. And so everyone would stand at their own tent and they would watch because it was an amazing scene. They're going, no way, no way. He's going to talk to God. No one goes into the presence of God. You don't just talk to God. You don't come into the presence of God. Human beings do not interact with God like that. And so everyone's standing, waiting. And I, I just wanted the tent there because I'm saying, what if that happened tonight? What if I told you, hey guys, right now I'm going to have Louie come up and he's going to go into the tent of meeting and he's going to meet with God and we're going to watch, okay? All of us are going to watch God descend and it's just going to be God and Louie in there. Picture that in your mind. Picture how we would all stand in awe and go, no way, shut up. This is not happening. God is going to visit us in that way. Louis, a human being, is going to go into the tent. He's going to climb in there. It's going to be him and the creator of God. See, this is the way they viewed this meeting with God. And what's crazy to me is, is nowadays how we treat this time with God as ordinary or even burdensome. To where we try to squeeze in like five minutes at the end of our day, like I gotta try to get some time with him. I, I'm gonna, I feel guilty because I, need, I only got like two or three minutes. You guys, do you understand? I, I just, I was reading this in Exodus and going, man, how did we come so far? Where it used to be, no way, a man is going to meet with Almighty God, with him. And they would see the lightning, the thunder, the fire. And now it's like a burden. And we have pastors that beg us, please, 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 just, just give them a few minutes. Please, just try to read through the Bible in a year. It only takes like 10, 15 minutes a day. Just, just try to hear from him, please. Like, how did we get here? I, I had a 
my mentor, this pastor in India, who I look up to so much, he, he called me a few months ago, earlier last year, and he, he was crying on the phone. He's never cried to me. I'm sure he's cried, but you know, he, he, he called me crying because a, another pastor, you know, of a big church had fallen in immorality and, and he was crying and what he said to me on the phone was, he goes, Francis, I don't understand it. I don't understand just some of the things that happen in your country. He goes, sometimes I even meet pastors and after meeting with them, I go, God, I wish that man knew you. I wish he loved you. I wish he understood you. I wish he didn't just talk about you. And, and he wasn't judging. I mean, he was in tears. He said, And this is what he said. He goes, friends, and sometimes I feel like the people in America, they'd rather just meet Moses and take a picture with him. He says, don't they know that they can go up the mountain themselves? How come they don't want to go up the mountain? How come they don't want to be alone with God? And I thought he's right. Man, some of us can get so caught up in people that you would say, oh man, I would love to take a selfie with Moses. And he's just saying, do you understand the gap? The difference? Man, I hope you love what we're doing here, but I hope that you're the man or woman that goes, you know what I really love though? I love just getting away from everyone and going up that mountain. I love to just get into a tent where no one else is around and just go, oh my gosh, this is awesome, God. I'm in your presence. You have access to the tent. That's what Louis was preaching about last night. That's the amazing thing is that because we have access, because it's finished, the job is done, I can go into the presence of God, but just because I have access doesn't mean that I make it an unholy time and I make it a common time. But what I've been trying to do, and I have to fight for this, for my mindset, I picture myself, sometimes I do go into this little room. I mean, just a few months ago, after reading this, I'm going, man, I'm going to build me a little room that no one else is allowed in. I just want this little tiny room, this little closet in the garage. And, 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 and I just picture myself going, man, this is just like the tent. I'm going in here. I just have to fight to get all the other thoughts out of my mind. I know you guys know what I'm talking about, where you try to pray first five seconds are good and then suddenly all your phone buzzes try to ignore it but your mind is going nuts look my biggest concern for your generation I thought about this my biggest concern for you is your inability to focus in prayer you guys, this is huge, and I, 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 I see it in my kids. I have kids your age, and I think, uh, isn't that crazy? I have kids your age, and I have a newborn, but forget about that. I, I see how it's like, bam, 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 you know, I'm doing da, 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 all of this stuff, and, 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 and you've got, so you, your mind is going nuts. I mean, mine has gotten that way, but I remember when I was younger, and we didn't have all of this stuff, you, you know, I could focus a little easier. I still had to fight for it. Because I've always had ADD. I've always had this attention deficit. So when I get to pray, I couldn't, I, I can't just sit quietly. You know, it's like I try, but my mind wanders. So then I stand and then I, I try to walk, you know, or I, I, or I, when I read the scriptures, I read it out loud or I pray out loud. And sometimes I have to just like get my mind totally psyched into this and picture myself on that mountaintop and go, God, this is awesome. This is just as real as it was for Moses. I'm talking to the same God. I fight and I fight and I fight. That's what we have to do nowadays. I'm so concerned for some of you 
because we're just used to multitasking. It's the norm. I, this 2014, it, it, it was probably the most productive year of my life. Okay, I loved it. Because when I look back at 2014, I go, man, I did this and this and this and this because I can do three things at a time now. It, it, and, and, and I like it. I like to be, you know, looking at someone in the eyes and, and yet in my head be thinking about eight other problems I'm trying to solve and, you know, and then I didn't really hear their problem. And I'm going, what, what, explain it to me again. You know, it, it's just, but I would get so much done. And at the end of the, at, at, at the, end of the night, because I, I hate laziness and I hate not being productive. And so when I go to bed at night, I go, man, I did like three days work today. This is awesome. It's like I ripped off the day. And, uh, <laughs> but I noticed, you know, during the last couple months when I would try to get alone with God, it was so hard to do only one thing at a time and only think of one thing. And so while it was great that I could multitask and do all these things, I was realizing that multitasking is keeping me from wholehearted worship. I, you know, the Bible says I have to love him, that I, I should want to love him with all of my heart, all of my mind, not parts of it. And that's why for me, I had to build a little tent. I had to get a space and I had to fight. I had to pace back and forth. I had to pray out loud. I had to sing. I had to, you know, even pray louder and louder. I, I just had to work at it to, to, to fight all the distractions. And this is me. At least I remember when it used to be quieter. Some of you just grow up in this time where you're constantly thinking. And some of you, you, those of you who even try to get alone with God, your thoughts wander, you think of things you have to do. Then you, you think, oh man, here I am with my Bible and my coffee. You know what, let me take a picture of this. You know, right? And so you can just show all your friends, oh, hanging with Jesus and my coffee, click. Hashtag holy moment. You know, it's just, <laughs> right? It goes through your mind. I got to put this on Facebook. I got to do something. It's just your mind is always going somewhere. A verse that really helped me as, as, I, was, as I was wrestling with all of this is 1 Peter 4, 7. In 1 Peter 4, 7, it says this. It says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore... Be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Okay, God's reminding us. He's saying, look, the end of all things is at hand. Look, this could all end at any moment. All of these little things that are going into our heads that we're preoccupied. is the end of all things is at hand. But then he says, therefore, be self-controlled controlled learn to control yourself learn to control this word talks about controlling your mind it's this idea of taking every thought captive that means rather than just saying, oh, you know what, oh, you, you know, I got I to gotta update my Facebook, I got to check up, you know, this guy's Facebook, I got I to gotta look at every tweet, I've got to find out every news story, I got to know every stat of my favorite sports team, I've got to know this, I've got to know this, I've got to see what's happening. Boom, 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 I got to see every new YouTube video, it's hilarious, I got to see every movie that comes out, it's just, you, but instead say, no, no, control yourself, be self-controlled self-controlled and sober-minded, clear-minded. The opposite of this is, is being drunk to where your mind can't think clearly. The opposite of this is having a mind that is, that is, that is cluttered with so many different thoughts. We have to learn how to control our minds, to have self-control. It took self-control when I was flying here on the plane today. As I walk down the aisle, everyone's watching a different movie, and I'm going, oh, man, I would love to just veg right now, 
I'm not saying that's always wrong. I'm just saying right now, I would just love to veg, just turn my mind out, and just let something else enter it, and I don't have to think. No, 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 self-control, self-control. What would God want me to do? I'm going to focus. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for the students that I'm about to speak to. God, get me to focus. I'm not going to just let everything in my mind to clutter it up. I want to be sober-minded, clear-minded, focused. Yesterday I had lunch with a friend of mine, um, pastor of a huge church, bunch of kids, I know that many, only like four, but um, he was telling me about how uh, just recently he went to this place to be alone with God, and it was a place where you're left by yourself, no phone, no TV, no internet, just, just you and your Bible. Total silence for 21 days. 21 days of just silence. Just you, God, and your Bible. He said it was so amazing how it took him a couple of days just to detox for his mind for all these things that are going on. But then when he came back and told his wife about it, he says, you know what, honey, you've got to go. And she left the kids and left her life and just went and was alone with God in silence for 21 days. And she said, it, it, she was just describing to me everything that she went through. And she goes, then when you come back, you know, then I'm back in the world, I'm with friends. And she goes, it was so weird. Like, I, I was so in love with Jesus that I'm with people. And I started getting antsy. Like, oh, I just want to get back alone with Jesus. Like, I, I miss him. I, I, she goes, I, I just, it was like I was going through, like, withdrawals. You know, like, Jesus, I got I to gotta get back to Jesus to be alone with him. Because I love him, I love him, I love him. But I want you to think. What goes through your mind when you hear that? 21 days. Detached from everyone else. With just the Bible and Jesus. Because I talk to people who say, wow, that's weird. Talk to people that have, uh, you know, whose, whose response was just like, oh, I don't think I could do that. I don't know if I'd want to do that. And I just think, man, that's, that's a little strange that we would call that weird or that we wouldn't just, like, like, something's wrong when we don't long to be with him. And Satan's doing everything he can to distract our minds. And that's why the Bible says you've got to fight for this. You've got to show self-control if you really want to do this. But, but what I love about this verse is it says, you know, so, so be, be, uh, uh, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. For the sake of your prayers. See, because so often we think of prayer as a means to an end. So it's weird to have a verse that says, no, you've got to work at this. You've got to be self-controlled. You've got to be sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Prayer is the goal. You've got to understand that. Yes, there are times when we pray for something. But here what he's talking about is that prayer is the goal. The goal, he says, look, the end of all things is at hand. Christ could come back at any time. Therefore, the one thing that you want to have in your life is a great focused prayer time. I mean, think about it. If Jesus was returning tonight, wouldn't that be the one thing you'd want to be so solid? Like, oh, I know him. I was just with him. I just went up the mountain, I was, I was there, and there he is, there he is, there he is. 
He says, so fight for this. Clear your mind. Find your mountaintop. Find your tent. Learn to detox from everything else to be clear-minded for the sake of your prayers. And have an amazing worship time with him. You know, the Bible says, uh, you know, John was, Piper was preaching out of 2 Corinthians 4. And one of my favorite verses is uh, verse 17, 18. It says, for this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. So we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. He's saying, take your mind off the things you can see and start staring at the things that are unseen because everything you can see is temporary. Um, another friend of mine just went to, I live out close to Stanford University and there's a, there's a virtual reality center there where they make like the latest whatever virtual reality stuff. And he was telling me he went on this tour, you know, just this select tour with a small group of people. In fact, I'm going to do it in two weeks. I'm so looking forward to it. He says, you, you go in this room, right, and you put on these glasses, and you put on these glasses. You're by yourself. You're in this room. You put on these glasses, and everything looks the same, except you notice a piece of wood in front of you, and you're going... Boy, that wasn't there before. But you, you swear you're still in the same place and everything's the same except for that plank of wood. He says, then suddenly you see parts of the ground start dropping down around you. You know, like in the movies where everything starts crumbling down around you. And he says, and then you have to, you know, you hear this voice. I forget why he's explaining. He says, you have to walk across this plank now to get to that other place of safety and all the sound effects and everything is so real that he says as you watch people do it they've got these glasses on and they're shaking and they're walking you know it's like this just because in their mind it's so so real and he says and then and then the, the, the instructor says okay go ahead and step off the plank because you know it's not real and two-thirds of the people can't step off because they're just going, no way, no way. And then it says, you know, if you do step off, you, you suddenly, the, the sound, everything, you just immediately fall to your, because it, it makes you feel like you're just falling in this endless pit and you just get sick to your stomach. I mean, it was just the craziest thing. Because in your, he goes, in my head, I know. I know this isn't reality, but I, I can't get my mind around it. And when he was explaining it to me, I'm going, man, that's so what the Bible says. Is that, that we're looking at all these things and we think that this is all there is, that this is reality. And what the Bible says is, no, these are all temporary things. There's a greater reality going on. And we have to learn to be able to take these glasses off or in our head know that no, this is all temporary. I know there's something else. I can step off of this and I can seek the kingdom first. Like God is going to catch me. He's there. I can step out of the boat. I know he's there. He's real. And to start looking at the world in a different way. But it takes focus. Man. Man. My only prayer for my time with you at Passion this year was that, God, I just want these men and women to long for you. If I could help them get on a pattern where it's not just a checklist of, did you, did you have your devotions? Did you spend at least 10 minutes in prayer? and trying to squeeze it in rather than really experiencing God and going, okay, what Moses went through, that's no different. I can have that. See, what I want you to understand is just like we look at this 
and said, man, what if this really was the tent of meeting and you could go in there or we saw Louis go in there and we saw the cloud descend. You could picture that, right? I mean, the truth is, is that we're in the tabernacle right now. In fact, the Bible says we are the tabernacle. That somehow we're like these living stones. You know, Peter tells us that, that we, we, we stack ourselves onto each other and we're like forming a temple. That's why you don't want to be, a, a, you know, just off on your own apart from the body, but somehow together we somehow form this temple, this tabernacle, and God dwells with us. But because some of us have heard these things all our lives about how we can meet with God, it's easy for it to become common. And my prayer is that some of you would just fight, fight for your minds again to where you can focus and you don't let the enemy distract you. Because I'm telling you, the enemy hates our prayers. He would love for you just to be busy with a lot of nice Christian acts and things to do. Just stay off of your knees and break off this, commit, this contact with God. He wants you detached from him. Because Jesus says, if you abide in me, you're going to bear so much fruit. But apart from me, you're going to be able to do nothing. Here's what I want us to do. I want to just give you a few minutes of silence. Would you just bow your heads right now? I want you to picture that scene in Exodus 19 where all the people were standing at the base of the mountain. And they're watching as Moses goes up the mountain. And the whole place filled with smoke and this, this large cloud descending into it, and, and, and Moses is talking to God, and God's answering him in thunder, and you're standing at the base of the mountain going, no way. And then Moses comes down off the mountain and tells you about this whole event, but then he says, now you go up there. You go up that mountain now, it's your turn. So just block everything else out of your mind right now. And just walk up in the mountain. You have access to God now. As Louis said, that veil is torn top to bottom. You can go into the tabernacle. You can go up into the mountain and come in the presence of God and just talk to him. <laughs>